All right, today I'm preaching on the heresy of work salvation, the heresy of work salvation. Um, so just continuing on from last week, I uh, just wanted to go into this topic a little bit deeper and uh, talk about some of the ways that uh, people preach work salvation, sometimes unknowingly, and sometimes you'll hear these message, messages in other churches. So um, the heresy of work salvation. Now, what is a heresy? When we use that word heresy, what we tend to mean by it, it's, it's a belief where if somebody was to believe that, they would not be saved, right? So there's, not, there's, a, there's, a, there's many heresies. One is them if you believe you have to work your way to heaven. Another heresy would be you know, if you deny the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul addresses a heresy where they were denying the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And he was saying, well, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then how can you rise from the dead? That's the hope you have. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, your faith is vain. You're, still, you're yet in your sins. So there are certain things that we must believe in order to be saved. And one of them is we have to fully put our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if anyone teaches, hey, you actually need to do works in order to get yourself to heaven, then they're actually condemning that person to hell if they put that, their faith in that message rather than on the Lord Jesus Christ. And like I was talking about last week, you know, Paul was obviously very passionate about people preaching work salvation in the Galatian church. People were creeping in saying that, hey, they had to commit, they had to... Uh, you know, keep circumcision in order to be saved. Just one work and, you know, look at the words that he had for them. Not only uh, did he have some strong words, but like I mentioned last week, this was the epistle that he penned himself. It was something he treated with such seriousness. In Galatians 1.6, look at what, what he says. And this really should be the attitude we have towards heresy, towards, you know, false gospels that are out there. He says, I marvel... So marvel means I'm shocked, right? I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And if you understand the gospel and how simple it is, how glorious it is, you would be shocked that people would want to go back to a belief of, you know, having to work their way to heaven. You know what I mean? It's like he's shocked that, hey, you know about the grace of God, yet you want to go back under the burden of work salvation. So what is he saying here? Unto another gospel. But he's saying, which is not another. Why is he saying that? Because there is no other gospel than the true gospel, which is that Christ was buried, he rose again the third day, and we put our faith on that to be saved. Which is not another. But there be some that trouble you, right? And these are the people that are creeping into the Galatian church. And would pervert the gospel of Christ. So notice that sometimes work salvation... I mean, there are the blatant ones out there where it's like, you know, Buddhism obviously is a works form of salvation. You've got Islam is like a works form of salvation. But oftentimes the most dangerous forms of work salvation are the ones that come packaged as Christianity, right? They come packaged as Christianity, but it's perverting the gospel of Christ. So it's not something completely different. It's, it's using all the same terminology, right? And all the cliches that, that Christian, Christianity uses, but it's teaching something a little different. But look at what Paul says. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So pretty strong words for the people that are out there preaching a false gospel. And he's saying, look, even if we, so he's saying, even if the apostles of Jesus, you know, preached a false gospel, he feels that way about them, or an angel from heaven, right? So Joseph Smith and Muhammad, they should have taken heed to Paul's words here, because that's exactly what happened with them. You know, Joseph Smith approached by the angel Moroni. Was it really an angel? Or, you know, Muhammad in the cave. He was approached by the angel Gabriel, right? Now, we obviously believe that these were devils masquerading as angels, but even if it was an angel coming at them with another gospel, Paul warned that, hey, it doesn't matter who gives the message, right? And this is what people have to understand from here too. You don't, you know, stake the credibility of the message of who is telling you. Right? Because here he's saying it doesn't matter who tells you the message. If it's a false message, it's false. Right? So 
the credibility of the message does not come from the messenger. The credibility of the message comes from the source of truth, right, which is the Word of God. Look what he says here, just on the topic of work salvation. Romans 10, this is Paul saying to the Israelites, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now that saying doesn't only refer to the Israelites, right, back then. I mean, a lot of people, they're, they're passionately, you know, they've got the right intention, they want to serve God, right? And maybe they, you know, genuinely want to do something right. That's why they believe work salvation. But Paul is saying here, hey, they, have a, they may have the zeal of God, but it's not according to knowledge. Verse 3, for they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So you see, what's the problem with them having this zeal of God but not according to knowledge? Well, the problem is they, they might want to do the right thing, but they're not saved because they're trusting the wrong thing. Right? They're, trust, they're trying to establish their own righteousness rather than submitting to God's righteousness. Well, how do you submit to God's righteousness? Verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. See, so we're not saying that Christ is the end of the law full stop, because we still believe, hey, you ought to try and keep the commandments. But what is being stopped here? He's saying, no, the Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believe it. Right? So generally when we talk about salvation by grace, we addressed one of the objection, main objections last week, which is, you know, why would someone do works if they're saved either way? And we, I talked about some reasons at the end of that sermon. So go back and listen to that if you weren't um, there or you, or you don't remember. But other people may say as well, you know, well, you don't think people should strive to do works. And that's not true either, right? So we, we obviously believe that even though you're saved, people should strive to do works. We just want to make sure that they're separate. So if you can imagine two circles, right? Two circles, you know, if you know maths, you have like Venn diagrams, right? And if the, the diagrams overlap, then they have some commonalities, right? But if you split up those two circles, we'd say that's, that's mutually exclusive, meaning they, they have nothing to do with one another, right? And that's how salvation in the Christian life works. You, on the one hand, you have salvation, that's by grace. That's one circle, right? And then on the other hand, you've got the Christian life. That's the good works, that's the coming to church, that's the reading your Bible, the prayer. You don't need to do these in order to obtain grace. And where people sometimes get confused, they start mixing those two circles together. And obviously if you mix those two together, that's when you end up with work salvation. So you just need to make sure in your mind, you know, that these two circles are different. You have the decision to get saved, and then you have the decision to follow Jesus Christ and obey his commandments and do all those things. And one does not depend on the other. But this is where people always get confused because when we are talking about the circle of grace and how to be saved and we say, hey, you don't need to keep works to be saved. These things are not a requirement for salvation. The people that have always thought their whole life that they have to keep the works to be saved, they think, well, don't, but then we don't we have to keep the works? Well, we're not talk, we're not saying that works is not something that should be done we're saying that it doesn't need to be done in order to obtain grace right so we just need to make sure these concepts are separate and that's that's generally the misunderstanding if you have to share the gospel with somebody and you're trying to explain these concepts of grace hey we don't need to do these things in order to be saved this is generally the conversation you're going to have because they're what they're hearing because all their life and what everyone else is telling them is that to earn their way to heaven that's what they're hearing when, they're, when you're talking to them. You just need to be aware of that. So when you explain it to them, you've got to try and get rid of those misconceptions out of their mind. Right? So today I'm not talking about these blatant forms of work salvation, which are other religions other than Christianity. Today I want to talk to you about ways that Christian churches, you may hear work salvation. And I want you to understand that when the gospel is explained this way, this is not the true gospel of Jesus Christ. This is forms of work salvation, subtle though they may be, right? They are work salvation. Now, not everyone who uses these cliches and these Christian sayings always means work salvation. So I don't want you to go away thinking that just because you hear somebody say this, that's heretic, like, because sometimes people are just repeating things that they've heard, 
but when you drill down, what do they actually understand? They understand salvation, right? They're just using the wrong terminology. But sometimes people use this terminology and they do mean what they're saying, and this is, this is wrong, right? This is, this is, these are heresies, right? So let's go through them. I've got seven for you today, and I'll try and go through them as, as quick as I can, and we'll go to some verses. A bit, a bit of overlap from last week, but it'll just reinforce what we talked about last week. First one is when they say you need to do your part. So I touched on this last week where they say, yeah, Jesus you know, either allows you to, to work for yourself, you know, to, to, to obtain salvation. Jesus gets you 99% of the way there, but you have to do your part. You know, Jesus enables you to then earn your way to salvation. Anything like that, this is a form of work salvation. The fact that you need to do your part. Romans 11. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So the Bible is making it very clear. We can't mix these two concepts. If something something's either free or you pay for it. That's why when we talk about those two circles, one of grace and one of the Christian life, once you mix them together, that's like corrupting the grace circle. right? So once you mix them together, it's all works. And you're a debtor to do the whole law. Galatians 5, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by, by the law, ye are fallen from grace. So you see how it's not that, hey, if you mix these two circles, Christ's going to profit you 99%, or Christ is going to profit you as much as you want to apply Christ to your salvation. The Bible's saying if you try and work for your salvation at all, Christ profits you nothing. You're basically forfeiting that circle of grace because you are rejecting the circle of grace and you're trying to earn salvation by works. Right? So we need to make sure when it comes to salvation, when we put our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, we are trusting Him alone for our salvation, not just to get us part of the way there and then we do the rest. Oftentimes when people talk about, hey, we've got to do our part, that hopefully what they're referring to is as a saved believer, as a born-again believer, as a person that can never lose their salvation, we should do good works. Amen to that. Right? See, there's nothing wrong with good works. It's just where you have it. Right? If you have it after the point of salvation, that's a good thing. If you have it before the point of salvation, that's heresy. It's like baptism. Is baptism a good thing? Baptism is a great thing after salvation, right? If you have to get baptized to be saved, that's heresy. You know, it's a bit like fornication in a marriage, right? Like, you know, the, the relationship between husband and wife, it's a beautiful thing after marriage. But before marriage, it's a dirty thing. It's a sinful thing, right? Similar thing when it comes to good works and salvation. Number two, number two, and I'm sure we've, we've all heard these, right? You know, you go to a church service, it's emotional, music's playing, the altar call, right? The altar call at the end. And it's, uh, you know, don't delay. Hey, I agree, don't delay. Salvation, come to Jesus. And then they say, give your life to Jesus, right? Now, this is why when I talk about these, these sayings that, they're, they're cliche sayings, right? Because, hey, this is a good thing for Christians to do. Like, all these things I'm talking about here, these are good to do. But when they're included in the call to salvation, that's the problem, right? Because what's being preached now is work salvation. Now, why give your life to Jesus, right? Now, the, the worst thing about this one is that this is, this is the complete opposite of salvation, right? What is salvation? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but of everlasting life. Right? So the gospel is Jesus gave his life for me. The gospel is not I give my life to Jesus to be saved. You see how this it's the complete opposite. But that's what works is. Works is when you say, I will follow Jesus. I will keep his commandments. Right? I will give my life to Jesus. And that is a daily, lifelong pursuit. 
you know and that's why it's people that believe you have to do these things to be saved i mean it's impossible to fulfill these to perfection and it's something that christians saved born again believers struggle with day in and day out you have ups and you have downs so to, to believe that this will get you to heaven is impossible i said it's the complete opposite look at what uh, jesus says here in uh, matthew 20 but jesus called them unto him and said ye know that the princes of the gentiles exercise dominion over them and they that are great exercise authority upon them but it shall not be so among you but whosoever will be great among you let him be your minister and whosoever will be chief among you let him be your servant even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many so notice that we don't give our life to get saved jesus gave his life for us and in response to that if we love jesus we'll give our life to him but whether we do or not we're still saved because we're saved by grace galatians 1 grace be to you and peace from god the father and from our lord jesus christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of, uh, of god and our father to whom be glory forever and ever amen give your life to jesus right so again this is not a bad thing to do now do i believe you should give your life to jesus of course right but if you need to give your life to jesus to be saved that's work salvation what about this one number three is make jesus lord of your life right so sometimes people will say hey you need to accept jesus as your lord and savior so we just need to be careful with the way we word things because people understand things differently right so when when what is salvation salvation is not making jesus lord of your life right salvation is making jesus your savior right what's the difference because when jesus is your savior that's jesus doing something for you that's salvation but when you make jesus the lord of your life what are you saying well when you make jesus the lord of your life you're saying hey i'm willing to obey jesus right and we don't believe salvation comes by works so salvation is making jesus your savior the christian life is making jesus your lord the whole package you know ideally a christian makes jesus their savior and their lord right but nobody does this to a perfect extent right because some people there's this saying in christianity and it's a, it's a it's an incorrect saying but people will say things like this they'll say if he's not lord of all then he's not lord at all that's sometimes what they say they say if he's not lord of all meaning if jesus is not the lord of all of your life then he's not lord at all what they're saying is if you're not keeping works 100 percent then you're not saved that's what they're saying with that but is that the truth because if that was the case if you needed to make jesus the lord of your life and the lord of all you know what that would mean you would have to be perfect because every time you sin you know who's the lord in that instance it's not jesus <laughs> look what jesus says in uh john 8 34 jesus answered them verily verily i say unto you whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin so you see how why is it like that in the christian life because we have this we have the spirit and the flesh right sometimes you walk in the spirit jesus is lord sometimes you walk in the flesh you are lord now right you're servant you're a servant of sin when you sin so if jesus has to be lord of all for him to be lord at all that would mean you would have to be perfect right and and that's not possible right that's work salvation romans 6 know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants ye are to whom ye obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness Right? so when you're a servant of somebody which is what you're saying when you're making jesus your lord so that's something we strive to do in the christian life but it's not something we can achieve and that's why we can't trust it to be saved a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil for of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh and why call ye me lord lord and do not the things which i say so even if somebody says oh, i make jesus the lord of my life 
and doesn't actually do it. So it's, it's not Je making Jesus the Lord of your life is not something that you just say. Making Jesus Lord of your life is the way you live. Right? It's what you do. And Jesus is saying here to say, why are you calling me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? To say, to, to make him in Lord in name only is, is vain. Right? We make him Lord in the way that we live. It's when we submit to his will every day. That's the Christian life. And that's a hard thing to do. Right? It's something we need grace. We need encouragement. We need to be provoked at church unto love and to good works to keep these good works. Right? Because it's not automatic. It's not easy. Salvation is easy because Jesus did the hard part for us. Matthew 7, Jesus talks about people that made him their Lord, but not their Savior. Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. So, I mean, these are not people. I mean, if you were to probably meet somebody like this in your day to day life, I mean, prophesying in Jesus' name, I mean, how many people cast out devils in Jesus' name? I mean, these are not just people that are just, you know, your average Joe Christian that says he goes to church and then goes every Sunday. I mean, these are like people that, you know, were doing some pretty quote-unquote amazing things in the name of Jesus, prophesying in his name, casting out devils in his name, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. Verse 23, look what Jesus says. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. See, it's not I used to know you and now I don't know you anymore. It's like, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What was the problem with these people? Now, if you, if you stood before Jesus, all right, and Jesus is going to ask you the question, why should I let you into heaven? A saved person is not going to answer this way. Right? If, you, if you're standing before Jesus, Jesus is like, let's say, you because know, this is obviously not going to happen, right? We know from Luke 16, if you're not saved, you die. You open your eyes and you're in hell. There's no like people say, "Oh yeah, when I when I get to the big you know, get to the big guy, well, we'll chat it out, you know, negotiate your way into heaven." There's no negotiation. You're already condemned, right? God already knows what you've done. You you're not saved. You wake up. You're burning in hell, right? But when you're saved, you're carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, right? So it's it's not that you're judged already, right? We're already condemned. If you were to stand before Jesus. Jesus was to ask you, why would you be let into heaven? I mean, if the, your first thought is, yeah, but look at all this charity I've done. Look at how nice I am. Look at, all, look at me, you know, that's me. That's a sign that somebody's not saved, right? And it's here. You know, if, if you're not getting, getting let into heaven for some reason, you're not going to start saying, but look at all these things I've done for you, Jesus. What would a saved person say? But I believed on you. You know, you're my saviour. How could I not be let into heaven? Right? So we can see here that these people, they're not saved. Right? It's not that they were doing the works with like the wrong frame of, you know, wrong intention. These, like, some people will say like, oh, these people, well, they're just doing the, the, the thing, these things with the wrong, you know, the cheating people, all that sort of stuff. No, no, they are not letting into heaven and the first thing they look to is the things that they've done for Jesus in his name. And Jesus says, hey, depart from me, I never knew you. Ye that work iniquity. Why? Because all our righteousness is as filthy rags. If we try and do good works without being saved, I mean, they're, they're just filthy rags to God. So what is the will of God that we need to do in order to be saved? John 6.40 it says, This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So no, you don't need to make Jesus the Lord of your life to be saved. You need to make Jesus the Lord of your life to be an obedient Christian. Number four. Number four is when people believe or they teach that you can sin away salvation. Right? If you sin away, you sin enough, you can lose salvation. Or they say you can walk away from God. They'll say, um, you know, you can't, you, God won't let go of you, but you can walk away from God. Right? You can, you can, uh, basically lose salvation that way, right? which is not, not true. We talked about that a bit about that last week. Now look at what it says here in John 10. John 10. 
I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So this idea that Jesus will not let you go, but then you can leave Jesus' hand. I mean, aren't you included in that sentence when he says, no man can pluck you out of my hand? That, you, that people somehow think you can pluck yourself out of God's hand? So obviously you can't pluck yourself out of God's hand, just like nobody else can pluck you out of God's hand, because it's, it's not the fact, it's not who's plucking it out of the hand that's stopping you from getting plucked out of God's hand. It's the fact that God's holding you that nobody can pluck, get, get, get you out of God's hand. Right? So... Nobody can get out of God's hand once they're in God's hand. And uh, that's why the Bible says here that once you believe on Jesus, once you have eternal life, you'll never perish. Because, you know, losing eternal life, people, when people think about losing eternal life, they think that's a reflection of themselves. They think, well, because I don't keep the commandments, I do something, I'm losing eternal life. But what you're missing is, if you could lose eternal life, that's a reflection on God. Because God is the one that's making the promise saying, you will be saved forever. You will never perish. If you could lose salvation, that's making God a liar. That's not about you, right? Yeah, God knows you'll have ups and downs. But salvation, thank God, is not dependent on us, right? Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So salvation is eternal because Jesus died for all our sins, past, present, and future. Right? That's why there's, there's no sin I can commit in the future that, that, I can, that will send me to hell. I can't lose my salvation because if I could lose my salvation, that means there's a sin that Jesus didn't, that didn't die for. Right, but if he's died for all my sins in the future, what sin could I possibly commit in the future that isn't already under the blood? And that's why Romans 5 tells us, where, grace, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. But think about this a little bit more deeply, right? If you gain, you gain salvation by grace, right? So how, how, could you, how could you lose it by works, right? So you gained it by grace, meaning you never deserved it, but somehow then you became undeserving to keep it. But you never deserved it to begin with. And even if you could lose salvation, let's say you gain, you gain salvation by grace, because nobody, nobody wants to clearly teach that you need it by works, so they'll use these sort of things and say, you know, this is how you... But let's say you, you, so you gain salvation by grace freely, no works, but then you lose it for a lack of works. Couldn't you then just automatically get it back instantly by grace? Because, you know, you lost it, but then you don't have to gain it by work, so you get it back immediately. So wouldn't it just cause this, like, cycle of just, like, constantly losing it, getting it back, losing it, getting it back, losing it? But that's, that's what I think Romans 5 is explaining, right? In the sense that where sin abounded, grace is much more about. It's like it just keeps staying one, one step ahead. Not that you lose it and gain it and lose it and gain it and lose it and gain it, but, you know, so it just doesn't make sense. If you, if you lose it, because you don't deserve it, then you gain it again, but you don't deserve it. How do you lose something because you no longer deserve it when you never deserved it to begin with? That's why it's grace. Second Timothy 2, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. We talked about this last week. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Right? So that's denying us by when we're requesting something from God, right? Because we, we may ask for rewards, but we'll be denied if we didn't suffer with him. But if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. See, salvation is a promise from God. That's why, even if we lose faith, right, he will not go back on his promise, which was when you receive salvation by faith, it's eternal life. All right, number five. Number five is when they talk about, they, they, might, they might say this phrase, well, you know, it's not just faith. They say, you must have a saving faith. And oftentimes, what they mean by this saving faith is they mean works. Because they say, well, you, you don't have a saving faith if you don't have works. Right? And then they usually go to James 2, and I'll just quickly explain to you how, how, to, how to understand James 2. So this is where this sort of saying comes from, right? What doth the prophet, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Now, this is not a statement, right? This is a question. 
can faith save it? And the question is also, well, is this talking about a physical salvation, like actually being profitable to somebody physically, or is it talking about eternal salvation? Right? But either way, I mean, either way you would answer this question, you could answer it differently depending on what it's talking about. But this is not saying faith can't save him. It's just saying, hey, can faith save him? Well, it depends what is being talked about. I think in this passage it's quite clear that it's talking about the physical. Right? It's talking about actually physically benefiting somebody else. And why is that? Well, let's read on. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth the prophet? So notice the context of James 2 is not, are you saved? The context of James 2 is, how does your faith benefit somebody else if you don't add works to it? Which is true. If you just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and have no works, you're not going to be helping anyone else. It's a dead faith. That doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means that your faith is not benefiting anyone else. Sometimes our faith is dead. Sometimes it's alive, depending on how you live your life. Right? This is what he says here in verse 17. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. So notice, all this verse is saying is that that person, if they have not works, has a dead faith. Right? Now how do we understand this in light of salvation taught in the Bible? It just means you have a dead faith. That doesn't mean you're not saved. But the work salvationist will say, ah, see, dead means you're not saved. So they're just interpreting this passage differently. Right? But I don't think they can interpret it that way consistently, and we'll see that as we, as we talk about it. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. You see how the, the showing of the faith is still between people? Because you can't see my faith. So if I wanted to show you my faith, to show you the things that I believe, I'd have to add works to it to show you what I believe. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Now this verse is, is often so misabused, mis, like abused, used to teach work salvation. And, and people will say here, you know, ah, oh, you see, they'll say, the devils believe on Jesus Christ and they're not saved. Is that what it's saying? That does, that's not what it says. It says, thou believest that there is one God. Yeah, well, the Muslims believe there's one God. Are they saved? Right, so... The, all it's saying is, yeah, the, the devils know that there's one God, right? And it's saying, you know, if you believe and you don't have any works, it's basically comparing you to a devil. But it's not saying you're not saved. It's just, it's comparing in terms of our works, not saved. Because, you know, even if the devils did believe on Jesus Christ, they can't be saved because Jesus Christ didn't die for, for the angels, right? He died for flesh, right? For, for man. So that's not what that verse is saying. The point of this verse is just saying, hey, look, you know, you're no better than a devil if you just have faith without works. Right? It's not saying you're not saved. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Right? So you notice here, Abraham is being used as an example of somebody that has a living faith. Right? Faith where somebody added works to their faith. But notice the work that was done when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar. Just take a mental note of that. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works? And by faith, by, by works was faith made perfect. See? So again, it's you, you seeing. Seest thou. You see Abraham's faith. Not God. You see it. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then. Right? So you see not God, you see, then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Right? So that's where the saying comes from, where people say you have to have this saving faith, faith without works is dead. And usually they're just using this passage to teach a work salvation. Right? They, unless you have works, you're not saved. But what's the right understanding of James 2? Well, we get the right understanding of James 2 when we compare it with Romans 4. Right? And remember Abraham was used as an example in James 2. Romans 4, Abraham is also talked about. But now it's not talking about his works in the eyes of men and his faith in the eyes of men. Now it's talking about his faith in the eyes of God. And look at what Paul writes here. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory. Before who? 
before men, but not before God. You see there, James 2 is not saying it was justified by his works in the eyes of God, because Romans 4 makes it very clear. Hey, he's not justified by works in the eyes of God. If Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt, as I was talking about in the beginning. You have to work for something, that's not grace. That's something owed to you, right? And we are not saved by a reward. Don't, don't uh, uh, um, get this wrong conception that heaven is not a reward, right? People say, well, isn't heaven a reward? No, heaven is a gift. Salvation's a gift, right? What we get in heaven, those are the rewards, right? So a reward is not obtaining the ticket to heaven. The rewards are what you get when you're in heaven. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. It's pretty clear, right? No works, but grace through faith. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then, so what's the blessedness that he's talking about? Salvation. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? Saying, is this salvation only available to people that are circumcised, like the Jews, and not also to the Gentiles? He says, no. He says, for we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So we're saying that Abraham obtained righteousness by faith. He says, how was it then reckoned? So it's like, how, what was Abraham's state when he received salvation? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So you see how he's, he's sort of saying to the Jews, like, hey, you know, Abraham, your father, when he got saved, he wasn't circumcised as well. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. So you see, it's circumcision was given to Abraham to show because he already had believed on Jesus Christ. It was to, to show his faith on God in the Old Testament time. That he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised. So that includes us. That righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So remember in James 2, and this is really the, the, the real nail in the coffin for people trying to use Abraham in James 2 as a way of work salvation is because what he's saying here is, he's saying Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him righteousness. He was called the friend of God. And when, what, when did this happen? He says, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Sorry, let's go back a bit. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when? When he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar. But in Romans 4, when did he get saved? When did he receive grace? Well, it says here in uh, verse 10, how was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So notice, Abraham was saved even before he was circumcised. And if you look back at the story of Abraham, we're not going to do that now, but he was saved, then he received circumcision, then he gave birth, you know, then he had Ishmael, Right, and Ishmael, and then they were well, actually he had Ishmael, and then all of them were circumcised, right? Including Ishmael. Then what happened? Then Sarah was barren, the promise of Isaac, then Isaac was born, right? Then Isaac grows up, helps him carry the wood up to the mountain to be to, to almost be sacrificed. Many, this is like at least, you know, three decades after he gets saved. But people are, want to use James to sort of say, well, this is talking about Abraham's salvation. No, it's not talking about Abraham's salvation. Decades after he's received circumcision and the promises and his Isaac and then Isaac grows up. Right? Romans 4 is talking about his salvation, which is talking about even before he was saved. Right? So this idea of this saving faith, the saving faith is the faith that is on Jesus Christ. That's the saving faith. Right? But the, fa the, the saving faith, which is, well, you must have works to be saved, that's not a saving faith, right? That's a damning faith. 
Number six, number six is a big one that is amongst a lot of churches these days, unfortunately. It's really hard to find churches these days that really clearly preach salvation and don't mix in works. And really, one of the big ways where works is mixed in right now is they say, in order to be saved, you must repent of your sins to be saved. Right? Repent of your sins to be saved. Now, if, a person, if what a person means by that, repent of your sins, if what they mean by that is, I acknowledge that I have sinned against God, and I acknowledge that my sins make me worthy of death, right? And, 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 and then they believe on Jesus Christ, right? If that's what they mean by repent of your sins, you just mean admit you're a sinner and admit that your sins make you deserving of hell, then what they believe is right, but how they're describing it is wrong. Right? Like you can use any words you like. You know, I could say, I could say, I believe I have to work my way to heaven. But what, by work I mean faith. And by, you know, what you know, whatever, right? You can if you just change the meaning of words, I mean, yeah, you can believe the right thing. But you know, but we're talking about when you explain it to somebody else, you need to make sure you use the right words so that they understand the right concept. Because in the Bible, what repent means, it means to turn from something, right? And when you turn from sin, what you're saying is, I'm, stop, I'm going to stop sinning, right? That's what it means to, rep to repent from sins. Because what is a sin? 1 John 3, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So you see, when you sin, you're transgressing the law, you're breaking the commandments. When you turn from that, how do you turn from breaking a commandment? Well, you now have to keep the commandment. Right? So, to turn from the commandment, you have to keep the commandment. It's very clear here in Ezekiel 18, verse 26. Look at this. When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity. So you see, if you turn away from, from righteousness, doing the right thing, so you can repent from right and do wrong, and committeth iniquity and dieth in them. For his iniquity that he hath done shall he die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness, that he hath committed and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive, because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed. He shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet saith the house of Israel, The way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, saith the Lord. Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your, trans all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live. Now, if you read this passage, you don't get this idea that turning is just admitting that they're wrong. Like turning from sin, he's saying, if you turn from your iniquity, right, you're going to keep the commandments. But see, I don't know how many Christians around the world are comfortable saying, repent of your sins to be saved, but they would no way in hell, right, say, keep the commandments to be saved. But when they say, repent of your sins to be saved, that's what they're saying. They're saying, keep the commandments to be saved, right, because that's what it means. When you repent from sin, see, if you were, like, say, living in fornication, if you're going to turn from fornication, you can't just go, I admit I'm fornicating and it's wrong. Right? And turning from fornication means you stop fornicating, right? So now you're keeping the commandment to not fornicate, right? Or you, you're a liar, you turn from lying, you keep, you're, you're not telling the truth, you're keeping the commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness. Right? So turning from sin is works and that's why we repent of our sins every day right we try and do what's right it's part of the christian life we don't do it in order to get saved because salvation's by grace right and often this passage is used you say like well why is god saying things like this in the old testament because remember what we talked about last week the two ways to heaven there's works and there's grace so this is alluding to that covenant of works but the way we learn about how to turn from our sins and get that righteousness. Remember Romans 10 that we read at the beginning? 
We need to submit ourselves unto the righteousness of Christ, and we do that by faith. Right? We don't go about to establish our own righteousness. Jonah 3 is really the nail in the coffin for this whole repent of your sins idea to be saved. Right? Not repenting of your sins as a believer. Repenting, repenting of your sins to be saved. This here we see, you know, obviously Ezekiel was preaching to a city. Now we see Jonah preaching a similar message, right? When he went to Nineveh, telling them to turn from their sins. Who can tell? Now in Nineveh, they actually did do this. The, the city turned from their sins, right? Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Look at what it says in verse 10. And God saw their works. God saw their works. What did he see? He saw them turn from their evil way. That they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So a couple of things here. You see how turning from your evil way is defined as works? So if somebody says, you've got to turn from your evil way to be saved, they're saying you've got to keep works to be saved. Because God saw the works of the Ninevites. And in the physical sense, when he spared their nation, he spared their nation. But this verse is funny because it's like a double blow to this false doctrine. Because not only is it saying that repenting of your sin is works, it's also saying, and God repented of the evil that he said. So they're saying, but wait, repentance is like turning from sin. Well, that's why they have repentance, the wrong definition of repentance. Repentance just means to turn. That's why you repent of sin. So if repentance in and of itself means turn from sin, you can't turn from sin from sin, right? So you, you turn from something. But in this case, the city turned from their sin. What did God turn from? The evil that he said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So you see how you can repent from doing something good, right? Like the sons in the vineyard. They said, go to work, and he said, I go. And then they repented, they didn't go. Right? So you see how you can be going to do something good and then not do it. You can repent from good as well. So don't get confused with what repentance means. But people will say, but in the New Testament, Jesus preached repentance. John the Baptist preached repentance. All the apostles preached repentance. Yeah, but what did they mean by that? Now that we know that repentance doesn't mean in and of itself to turn from sin. What repentance are they preaching? Well, we don't have to guess. Because Paul clearly defines what the baptism of repentance was. Acts 19, it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So what's going on here? He comes across disciples, people that are following Jesus. But he realizes that they're not saved. He says, Have you... You received the Holy Ghost since you believed. And they said, it's the Holy Ghost. We don't even know who that is. So he's saying, how can you be saved and not know what the Holy Ghost is? Right? He says, he said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. And these people are baptized. Right? They're trying to follow Jesus, but they're not saved. Right? He says, who baptized you? Well, we were baptized by John. Then said Paul, John verily baptized. He's explaining to them now what the baptism meant. John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So what was the message of the baptism of repentance? Was it, turn from your sins? You know, you see the street preachers, turn or burn, forsake, and you'll find mercy. You know, which is really just work salvation, right? Like, I get, I don't think they have the wrong in motivation, right? You know, they obviously got, they're very, uh, what's, that's what I'm looking for, like, they're well intended, right? But they're just preaching the wrong message. The message of repentance is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Rather than believing on your own works, believing on a false religion. And this is re emphasized. In Hebrews 6, when Hebrews 6 mentions the foundational doctrines of Christianity, right? Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. 
and a faith toward God. See, the, the foundational doctrine of Christianity is not repentance from sin, right? Because nobody's trusting sin to get them to heaven. Right? We're not sinning our way into heaven. But you know what people are doing? They're trying to work their way to heaven, right? And the Bible's saying here, what you need to turn from is dead works, right? The works that if you trust will not get you saved. That's what needs to be turned from and of faith toward God, right? So repent of your sins to be saved. One last one, number seven, and, and this one's always a, like a, a little bit of a tricky one. And I mean, if you talk to people, you try and explain salvation to them, you get into this sort of conversation, they say, you don't need to follow Jesus. They say, you just need to be willing to follow Jesus, all right? And they say, like, it's not that you have to do it. You just, you just have to be willing to do it, all right? Is that, is that too much to ask? Willing to, well, according to salvation, I think it is too much to ask to be willing to follow Jesus because what does that even mean, willing to follow Jesus? Now, first of all, I mean, we read when we were at uh, Ezekiel, I mean, these are the sort of passages that they would use to teach. Well, you just need to be willing to keep the commandments. You don't have to actually keep the commandments. But any verse that they turn to that refers to keeping the commandments doesn't have this word willing in them, right? It's like here in Ezekiel 18 where we read. We'll read from verse 30. Therefore I will judge you, house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God, repent and be willing to turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. It doesn't say that, does it? It's repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. Verse 31, cast away from you all your transgressions. So this is not going to give us much hope if we're using a passage like this to say, well, I need to do this to get salvation because this is work salvation. This is what's not possible. This is why I need Jesus, right? In the New Testament, we have passages like this too in Galatians 3. It says here, for as many as are of other works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. So you notice that, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things, not some of the things, not just some of the things that you find easy to do, which are written in the book of the law to do them. Not to be willing to do them, to do them. Right? So this idea that you need to be willing to do works in order to be saved, that's just another form of work salvation. Right? And think about it. Why do you need to be willing to do something that's irrelevant for salvation? It's like if I said to you, here's a gift for you, but you need to be willing to pay for it. It's like, a gift, isn't it? Why do I need to be willing to pay for something that I don't need to pay for in order to receive it? You know, it's, it's irrelevant. So I don't need to be willing to do works to be saved. It's an irrelevant question. And like I showed you, what works salvation verse that they refer to even says you just need to be willing. That being willing is enough. And you know, and you know what ultimately happens. This whole willing to do works. And for those of you who've heard me preach about this, I always say this. This is how it works, right? They always say, no, 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 you don't have to keep do works. They say, you just have to be willing to do works. But then, you know what happens if you don't do works? Or you weren't really willing. Because are you really willing? It's like, hey, it's like you need to be willing to come to church. But if you don't come to church, are you really willing to come to church? So you see how it just, it just goes back to works because yeah, if you don't do them, you're not willing. Just like, you know, you have to have the saving faith. But if you don't have the works, you don't have the saving faith. So, just goes back to work salvation. So just be aware of this, right? Just in summary, you got you need to do your part to be saved. And these are all to be saved, right? We're not talking about the Christian life. Give your life to Jesus to be saved. That's work salvation. Make Jesus the Lord of your life. That's work salvation. To be saved. Sin can cause you to lose salvation, right? You need to keep doing works to stay saved. You must have a saving faith. What they mean by that is the work salvation, right? Saving faith is a faith on Jesus. You must repent of your sins to be saved. Or you must be willing to follow Jesus to be saved, right? These are all work salvation. All right, so we'll just read one more time. Galatians 1. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, 
which is not another. For there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Right? Like I didn't write those words, but those are strong words. You know, that's why I feel quite strongly about this topic, because why does it matter? Because when people preach a false gospel, that's not saving anyone. You say, Victor, is it possible for somebody to be saved who is teaching a work of salvation, is saying these things? Yeah. Right? Like it's, it's possible for somebody to be mixed up in these things, to have learned from the wrong person, to be, to be deceived, to be misled, and they're saying the wrong things. But they themselves are saved. Right? But the problem is, they're not going to get anyone saved teaching that to somebody else. You know? And if anyone believes that and thinks they're saved, they may not be. That's the danger. All right, so let's be very clear in our words. Let's understand salvation well. And let's not be caught up in these Christian cliches that sometimes are heretical. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for salvation, crystal clear. Thank you for the simplicity of salvation. We just put our faith on you. We're saved. And I pray, Lord, that uh, this gift that you've given us Lord, may the love that you've shown us compel us to serve you with our life and uh, help us to understand, Lord, that even if people make the wrong choice, they're still saved, but I pray, Lord, we would not use that um, as an excuse to sin. I pray, Lord, we would use that to, to increase our love and our gratitude for what you have done and do for us. So we thank you, Lord, for the Lord Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen.